Okay, guys, we're getting ready to get started. So, um, if you haven't already, fill out the attendance form up there. Um, we're just going to start off with a quick introduction to the course, but we're really excited that you guys are all here. This is Blockchain Fundamentals. If you're not here for blockchain, you're in the wrong class, so I don't know what class is on Saturday. Um, oh, sh Okay, has everybody gotten a chance to fill that out? <coughs> All right, we'll move on. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so what you can expect from us. Um, so hopefully you're in this course because you're excited about blockchain and you're excited to learn about what blockchain is. So you can get expect a fundamental understanding of blockchain technology and its applications. Um, so we're going to try and impress upon you that blockchain is not just a cryptocurrency, um, contrary to what you might think. And so we're going to give you an introduction to the high-level theory and then a little bit of the low-level technical details behind things like Bitcoin and then ultimately what a blockchain <coughs> might be. So I know that a lot of you might not be CS or technical majors, so um, you can expect some guidance and some extract abstraction. We're not going to get into sort of like how you're going to code in Solidity. That's the developer's decal. Um, so here at Blockchain Fundamentals, we sort of try to give you the best sort of mental model that you can um, possibly have to understand the blockchain space. So Brian's going to talk a little bit more about what we can expect from you guys. Hi guys. So um, what we expect from you. So we want your dedication. We want to treat. We want you to treat this course as a two-unit class because. Um, we're taking time out of our schedule, you guys all are too, and we want that you're, you have that attention and readiness to learn. So um, a good part of your grade will count from attendance and participation. Um, you can either participate in discussion, you can come to office hours by appointment, and you can also use Piazza to ask questions and learn from your peers. So um, and a little bit, uh, a little bit more about the course. We won't have a CS background. You don't need that to learn the most from this class. Um, it's open to everyone. It's a very inter interdisciplinary um, field. So um, we won't have any like, programming assignments or anything. All we expect is that you're just ready to learn and um, contribute to the discussion. Yeah. Uh, so this class is two units. So um, what that will consist of is you'll attend lecture and uh, one assigned discussion. So discussions will be all throughout the week with our beautiful um, discussion TAs. Um, the times are listed um, on the slide, and uh, hopefully you filled out the discussion preference form um, so that we can match you for uh, your right discussion. Um, lectures will be Saturdays, 2 to 4, in this building. And um, as for absences, um, we want that, uh, that you attend as many as you can. But we, we know that you might have activities that might come up or um, emergencies, so um, our Attendance, uh, I guess, policy is that you can miss up to two lecture absences and two discussion absences. So any more may lead to uh, no pass. So um, what we'll do is after you fill out the attendance form, we'll send out uh, we'll send out your specific uh, discussion this week, and then um, enrollment codes will be assigned during your discussion. Um, yeah, just a note, just one more time, please go to the one we assigned to you. Um, if you can't make that one, let us know, we'll handle it, but don't just show up to a discussion. Um, just because these first few weeks, the discussions are going to be really full, and so uh, we'd like to even it out and not have overwhelm any one TA. Okay. Okay, so if you haven't heard of uh, the club, just as like a, a short like overview. Um, this is Blockchain at Berkeley. Uh, we are all in the club, and so we put on this educational material in order to educate the community because that is the mission of the club. Okay, so if you haven't seen our symbol, or you want to pick up a flyer, or visit our website, um, this is just a brief overview of this is just a brief overview of the club structure. Um, the slides will be posted after class, so if this interests you, um, that's why it's in here. Okay, so we're just gonna do a brief introduction now. Hello everyone, my name is Nadir Akhtar. I am a second year computer science student. I've taught this class uh, for the past semester, briefly the semester before. I actually took this class, the first offering, fall 2016. So I, it just goes to show that this class really prepares you for blockchain. Hi, I'm Jillian. Um, I'm a second year in student computer science and a minor in bio-e. Um, I, I never actually took this class, but I've been in the blockchain space for about a year and a half now and I helped talk, teach it last semester. I'm um, really excited. Uh, if you want to talk to me more, office hours. 
Um, hi, I'm Brian. I'm a second year student. Um, I took the decal uh, with Nadir um, the first iteration in fall 2016, and I've been involved in the space for like a, a year and a half. Um, if you want to learn more, also talk to me. <laughs> and our TAs. Awesome. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm a freshman intended computer science major, and I'm the head TA and course administrator. My discussion time is 12 to 1 on Thursdays. Hey everyone, I'm Panda, second year Geeks and Bio -E Dome major. This is my third semester in the org, and my discussion is Monday, 10 to 11 a.m. Hi, my name is Noah. I'm a second year uh, majoring in CS. This is my second semester in the organization, and I'm a TA for the Friday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. discussion. Uh, what's up, guys? I'm Jason. I'm a second year CS major, and my section is from Wednesday, 1 to 2. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Derek. Um, I'm a second year CS major. Uh, my discussion time is Wednesday, 3 to 4. All right, so I want to go briefly over the standards and rationale for the course so that you know better coming in how this course is structured. So first and foremost, standards are that you'll have one homework and one quiz a week with um, readings involved, unless we otherwise say so. There will be black slides occasionally throughout the lectures for technical material or otherwise material that's hard to follow or hard to understand. If you're not paying attention, even at the start, you may get lost, so don't blame us for that. Right. We're very open to questions, no matter how stupid they may be. Like, don't be afraid to ask questions. That's the Berkeley mentality. Hopefully it's everyone's mentality. Right. But we may defer the questions that might be off topic or too in-depth for a lecture to discussion, right, which is where it's most appropriate. We have this course in two epochs, so to say. The first half being cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and the crypto space. And the second half being blockchain, advancing decentralized tech. So don't ask me in the beginning, oh, when are we going to talk about use cases? That'll come soon enough. In order to make sure that you understand the fundamentals of blockchain, you have to understand the most fundamental blockchain, which is Bitcoin and its associated uh, altcoins. Right. And some rationales for the structure of the course. We want to build up the highest possible mental model for you before we delve into specifics of how each component of blockchain or Bitcoin works. In other words, we build an image with the lowest resolution puzzle pieces available and then clarify how each of the puzzle pieces actually comes together in the real world, as opposed to focusing on one component for a week and then moving on uh, after that. And lectures are for learning, discussions are for discussing. So please keep in mind that like, if you have a question, like write it down, save it for discussion. We, if we don't answer it here, please don't feel bad. And your spot is very valuable. There are one and a half people that cannot be sitting in the seat that you have because of the fact that you're here. So please, please, if you're not interested in the course, if you are even concerned that you might not be able to attend, we ask that you give up your seat so that someone else who's just, if not more, uh, interested in joining can uh, be able to attend and learn from us. Any questions? Awesome. All right, let's get into the lecture. Bitcoin protocol and consensus, a high level overview. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain in high level terms, but accurate terms, what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it's meaningful in the world. And more accurate, or more importantly, what gives Bitcoin value in the real world. Right. A quick lecture overview. We'll begin with what is Bitcoin, move into the four different components that we like to focus on, identity, transactions, record keeping, or the blockchain, and then finally, proof of work. So first and foremost, what is Bitcoin? A quick show of hands, how many people know of Bitcoin? How many people know of blockchain? How many people actually own Bitcoin? All right, that's a, it gets larger and larger every semester. So what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, as most of you probably know, but then the question is, of course, what does cryptocurrency actually mean? Cryptocurrency is a currency that is built upon computer science, cryptography, and economics. Right? The computer science is to make the storage of the information and transfer of information efficient, cryptography to keep it secure, and economics to ensure that every actor in the system behaves uh, in a rational, or in a way that's incentivized to help everyone in the community. 
Right? This was born out of the cyberpunk <coughs> movement, which is a libertarian fight for privacy and self-governance. Uh, the cyberpunks, uh, born in the 1990s, were focused on preserving privacy, ensuring that identity did not have to be exposed because of some central entity's will or some government's will. They said that a person should only have to reveal their identity or lose their privacy of their own volition. And Bitcoin was designed prominently around this idea. Right? The cyberpunks, you will notice a lot of people don't follow that when they join the blockchain space nowadays, but if you look at people who have been in the Bitcoin space for a long time, you can tell that they're like, anarcho-capitalists, that they have this very anti-government, uh, decentralized, power to the people mentality. Bitcoin was the inspiration for the invention of the blockchain. It was how the term blockchain came about, because Satoshi Nakamoto, an anonymous identity, had written the 9 page white paper back in 2008. Right? Satoshi Nakamoto could be a man, a woman, a dog, a group of people, it could be anyone. We don't actually know who the inventor of Bitcoin is, which is fascinating, considering that it's the most prominent and most uh, rigorous cryptocurrency that exists. So you've probably heard these buzzwords before. I get that this is an outdated meme, but it has a lot of sentiment. We've used this in the course since fall 2016, and it was still outdated then. Um, so you'll learn exactly why each of these terms applies to Bitcoin by the end of this lecture. All right, so just keep these in mind as we're going through the lecture, seeing which ones apply and uh, how you can say, yes, I understand why Bitcoin is these things. Wow. All right. So in order to understand why Bitcoin is important, we first have to understand what currency is, but more importantly, the infrastructure that exists to move around and store currency, the bank. Right, so what does a bank provide? It provides four important things. It provides account and identity management. Banks will store your information on your behalf, they'll store your account balances on your behalf so that you don't have to do the bookkeeping yourself. Right? They will make sure that anyone who tries to use your funds is indeed you. You trust that you don't have to deal with that, that the bank will keep it secure for you. Services, they will transfer money on your behalf and let you withdraw money uh, given that you've authenticated yourself. Right? This way you don't have to store everything on a mattress or go to some, uh, put your money in some place that might not be as secure. You trust that the bank will let you do these things without you having to do it on your own. Right? If you want to tr transfer $10,000 to your grandmother, it would take a lot of wheelbarrows as opposed to just having a bank wire it for you. Record management. Banks will track account history, which is particularly useful for audits, meaning that if there's some information that you want to make sure hasn't been corrupted, manipulated, you trust that the bank is going to not only uh, record, your, uh, record your activity for you, but make sure that it can be verified by professionals, make sure that nothing illegitimate is up, which is where the trust comes in. Banks are regulated by the government. They are built by people who hopefully have a solid college degree, a solid education, and know what they're doing when it comes to banking. Right? These people exist for the primary purpose of manipulating money. Like, it's hopefully the best of the best that are doing this. But if we want to make a decentralized system that doesn't use the bank because we don't trust the bank, we don't trust the people there, we don't trust their incentives, we don't trust the motives, we don't trust that they are willing to like, act on our behalf first, like we've seen in the past like with the 2008 recession, how do we ensure that a decentralized system can do all of the things that a bank does? How do we keep all of the components of this infrastructure in a decentralized system with no central entity, with no central regulator, with no like, trusted people? That's what Bitcoin aims to do, and it aims to do it through these ways. Accounts and identity management, Addresses exist for every user, each of which is associated with a current with some amount of currency or some amount of Bitcoin, which the user produces on their own. The services, the transactions that are conducted between users, are done by other users as opposed to one central entity handling everything. Record management, redundant information is stored between thousands of users, users as a blockchain, all of the information of which is public, so that if you want to know what your account balance looks like, or more importantly, what the world looks like, you can access all of that information with just an internet connection. And finally, trust. The trust comes from not trust in people, but trust in the protocol, trust in the map that makes Bitcoin work the way it does. You trust that all of the uh, cryptography, computer science, and economics behind Bitcoin is legitimate enough to where it will perform the way that you expect it to. And then, of course, the question is, how does this all actually happen? All right, any questions? Um, you said that you could look inside like, other people's like, transactions. Right. Um, 
So the question was, I said that you can look inside other people's transactions. The answer is yes, you can look at all of the activity on the Bitcoin blockchain because all of that is public and needs to be public so that people can verify it. That the difference is that you don't know who people are unless you know what address they're associated with. So Bitcoin is anonymous in that you have to go through a lot of trouble to link someone's address to the real world identity to know what they're doing. Any other questions? All right. Identity. So I want to ask a quick question. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor for 30 seconds. What is the role of identity in the context of currencies, whether it be with banks or otherwise? So go ahead and chat, and I'll ask you after 30 seconds. <laughs> Can you elaborate on verification? Um, like ensuring someone's not trying to like, defraud someone else. All right. Any other questions or any other responses? Go ahead. So if you go to a bank, um, you show your identity and then the bank links that to you and then the ownership of the account then gives you the money. All right. So you can withdraw if you're able to prove that you are that person. Sending your money to? Mm -hmm. Being able to receive money. Right. So we have a verification, withdrawals, receiving money. Any other ones? Anything we've missed? There's 160 people in this room. There should be more than three ideas. All right. Last one. Well, what, what struck me if you hand over cash, you can't actually tell who had cash before. So it's actually the opposite of identity. It's one of the anonymity that I think is a feature of, uh, of, of our currencies today. If you talk about the handing over of cash, of course, if it's electronic, you could trace it back, but as such, when it was invented, it was rather anonymous. Right. So uh, the point brought up was that cash, cold hard cash, is anonymous. No one's tracking the movement of the cash. Uh, even when it's electronic, if you're able to do it with a service like Bitcoin, that's anonymous, you're not able to be tracked. And uh, that, I think, brings us into these points. Right, the role of identity in the context of currencies, you can do these three things with them. You can receive money, you can claim or spend money, and you can blame people who are trying to do things like defraud that they're not supposed to be able to. Right, receiving money, like, you don't want anyone to do these things unless they are you, of course. You don't want anyone inside your house unless they're you. You don't want anyone inside your email inbox unless they're you. And the way we protect against this is by having two different pieces of information one of which is public and meant to be shared so that we can receive, uh, claim money, and one of which is kept secret so that only we can access the funds or have the rights to manipulate this currency as we wish. Right? Houses will have addresses which you share with people as public information and that lets you receive and send, send mail. Uh, but your mailbox key you never want to share with anyone because if you do then they have access to all of that, all of that information. Emails are the same way. You have aliases and passwords. You never want to share your password with anyone, but you'd be comfortable sharing your email address because that's how people identify you. And Bitcoin has public keys and private keys, which serve the same purpose. The public key is a piece of information that you share with everyone else to say, this is who I am. You send money to this address. You receive money from this address. That's me. But the private key is the way that you say, I want this thing to happen. I want to show that I own this much money. And only if this private key can be provided, should you be able to let me do anything with this money? Right. And the blame comes in from whether or not someone's trying to use someone else's funds. In which case, you, if anyone tries to do anything malicious, then you're able to say, this person signed off on this activity, which is malicious or illegitimate. Now we can recognize the person and not let them do it again. 
Lane is much more difficult to identify in Bitcoin, of course, because it's a decentralized system. You don't know who anyone is, but it's still important to consider uh, as to how we can actually enforce Blaine, if at all. Right, and the point about cash is important because Bitcoin tries to emulate something which banks don't do. With a bank, you have to provide your passport, your social, sec your social security, as much information as you can to ensure that you are the person who you are. But with Bitcoin, all you need to provide is a private key and you can exchange money anonymously or pseudonymously to be more exact. So to clarify, each entity is a unique public key and a corresponding private key acts as the key to unlock that public key. The private key is actually chosen at random. Keep in mind in the bank system, the bank will create an identity on our behalf after we prove that we've been verified to be some person by an external entity. Right? The government says this passport is legit, it says this ID is legit, therefore you can go to the bank, take that ID with you, and say that you are this person. And the bank will use that government approved identity to make one for you on your behalf in the bank system. In Bitcoin, because there is no central entity that regulates everyone, you have to find a way to produce unique identities that can't be hacked into without a central entity. Right? And that comes from this idea of randomness. You'll create a, pub, a private key at random and use that random input in a function to produce your public key, which is also hopefully random, or it should be random. Right? And the public key is for, for receiving, as I mentioned, and the private key is for redeeming. And I'll go into the security in just a bit. Uh, one small note is that the address, when we mention addresses in Bitcoin, they are technically different than public keys and when it comes to public key cryptography. We'll make that distinction in the third lecture. For now, you can consider addresses and public keys to be synonymous, but please, a tentative uh, connection. Right. So to clarify on the public key security, right? you say, I produced my private key at random, I produced my public key at random, who's to say that no one actually owns this private or public key yet? Bitcoin has two to the 160 addresses. The entirety of Earth has two to the 63 grains of sand, right, which is many magnitudes less than, than the amount of addresses that Bitcoin has. Right, if you imagine all of that sand in a room, imagine two people choosing some grain of sand at random and getting the same one. But that, to get a better idea of what two to the 160 looks like, let's try thinking about an, a series of Earths where every grain of sand has a new Earth associated with it, with its own two, two to the 63 grains of sand, right? So that's two to the 63 squared, meaning that we now have two to the 128 grains of sand. That is still only 0.00058% of the amount of addresses available in Bitcoin. You could take these addresses and give them to the entirety of the world, right? You can give them to the entire population, which is about 7.5 billion. Every person has two to the 127 addresses all to themselves. They have, and they have that huge series of Earths, all that sand all to themselves without any overlap. The chance of two people picking the same grains of sand out of that entire mess is so unlikely that there's so many things that are more likely to happen before that. that it's almost in, incapable of fathoming two people having the same address. So are there any questions so far? Yeah. Go ahead. Let's say, you know, two people have the same address. How would Bitcoin deal with that issue? Right. So in the circumstance that two people have the same private key, which generates the same public key, right, they think they're the same person. In that case, they would be able to pretend to be each other. Like if I receive 10 Bitcoin to address 123, and you receive 10 Bitcoin to address 123, each of which has private key 456, I could use my Bitcoin to spend your, or I could use my private key to spend your Bitcoin and vice versa. Yes, the assumption is that it will never happen, so, no. Mm -hmm. So you said that the public key is random, but the private key is generated from the public key? Uh, the private key is random, public key generated, yeah. Okay. So, uh, what, does nobody know, like, somebody has to know the process for that, like, how to generate it from there, so can't somebody just, like, whoever knows that, and just, like, do that to everybody? Right, so there is a process, it's known as the elliptic curve digital si signature algorithm. It's very, We'll go over in lecture three. It's difficult to guess the private key from the public key, or obtain the private key from the public key. But it's very easy to take the private key and generate the public key. So it's a one-way function in that you can, you're safe, that you're hidden in plain sight, you can't reverse engineer the private key. So you can't pretend to be someone else. Where does the number come from? 
Right, so 2 to the 160 comes from that there are 160 bits in the address space. So there's 2 to the 160 different combinations. Go ahead. So the generation of the private key must be done by some computer or some server. Yes. It controls the computer. And right. What guarantees that that person controls the computer doesn't get control of the private keys? Right, so the question was, there must be a computer or server producing these private public key pairs. Who controls that computer and how can we trust them? The answer is that your own computer is the one that generates these private public keys. The algorithm to produce the private and public keys is actually not that difficult. Uh, there's a website called bitcoinwallet.org which will produce on your behalf a private and public key pair. It's very inexpensive, which is why uh, we'll talk about that later when it comes to consensus and identity. But we, you don't have to use that much energy to produce a private and public key pair. You just need to ensure that you don't share your private key with anyone else in the world, which is why we have offline. You don't want to put your private key anywhere online or connect it to the internet, because that'll mean your Bitcoin might get stolen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last one. Is it mathematically possible for two public addresses to have the same private key? Right. So if two public addresses have the same private key, that means, like, I suppose it would be no, the private key will generate a public key in a deterministic manner, meaning that the same private key always produces the same public key. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, go ahead and ask later. Yeah. All right, transactions. So we've gone over identity. Right? We know how to say what every person is doing, who they are, but we don't yet know how people actually do what Bitcoin fundamentally wants to do, which is send money between users. All right, new question. What makes a transaction valid? You have another 30 seconds. Go ahead, talk to your peers, and try to give some answers. Spoiler alert, there are three things that make a transaction valid. Go. Thanks. Okay, first bank looking for? That's the question. That you have the money in the first place, that the person you're sending to exists, they have a bank account that they're sending the money to. Alright, I'll go ahead and ask someone else, but that first point's correct, that uh, you have the money to send. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, an agreement between both parties. That's not quite what I'm looking for, but uh, we can discuss that later. Right then. Double spending, hey, can you elaborate a little bit? Like I'm sending the same amount of money to the different people at the same time? Right, ensuring that the funds have not been used in any other transaction. All right. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, back there. Do you lose money after you spend it? That you lose money after you spend it, uh, that I would say is implied uh, with the transaction, but before you let the transaction go through, what needs to be, what needs to be true? There's one very important thing that I think is so common you might not realize. That you own the money, right? You don't want anyone else spending your money. Even if the money's there, it doesn't use anywhere else. You want to make sure that you own the money, all right? So these are the three things that make a transaction valid: a proof of ownership, a signature, available funds, and that no other transactions are using the same funds, right? When we think about dollar bills, we have a dollar bill. The funds are available because it's in your hand. If people can see it, you prove that you own it because it's in your pocket. And you prove that no other transactions have used the same funds because you can't make $2 bills, hopefully. And then through a bank, the bank will check that you are who you say you are, whether it be with asking for your social security, your passport, the available funds, and the no other transactions using the same funds. You trust the bank to be correct in this, which is one issue that a lot of people have when banks aren't audited after every transaction, every set of transactions are audited every month, every few months, every year. You don't 
if you don't trust the bank is able to control the flow of their money, then that's why you'd want something like a cryptocurrency, where although it might be slower, it's verified at every step that every transaction is valid. Another black slide, so please make sure that you pay attention. If you get lost at the beginning, you're gonna be lost until the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, yeah. So Bitcoin uses what's known as an unspent transaction output model. In banks, we think of all of our money in one giant chest, right, that holds our $3.70 after birthday tuitions deducted. So the way that Bitcoin works is that instead you have unspent transaction outputs where instead of having a giant chest of money, you have individual piggy banks. After every, after every transaction when you receive money, you put the money you receive into a little piggy bank, a ceramic piggy bank. And every time you want to spend that money, you crack open the piggy bank and you give the money to whoever you want. The remaining money, you don't put back in the broken piggy bank, you put it in a new piggy bank, which is known in Bitcoin as a change address. So Bitcoin will use unspent transaction outputs in order to make it easier to tell which funds have been used and which funds have not been used. Right? It's much easier to say, this has or hasn't been used, a binary question, rather than, is this account trying to use more than it has available at this step of time? Yeah. Any questions so far? All right. So let's go into one example. Let's say that Brian, Brian's a billionaire because he bought the Bitcoin in 2008, 9, 10, and he wants to send me 101 Bitcoin. So he has currently two transaction outputs, one of 100 at the top and one of 50 at the bottom. He wants to send me 101. He says, all right, let me break open this first piggy bank. That's 100 Bitcoin as input to Nadir so far, but I need more. I need to give him exactly 101. So he breaks open the second piggy bank of 50, making for a total input of 150 to me thus far. He says, Nadir, you're gonna get 101 of these Bitcoins. But I don't want to give you the 49 because it's also paid for Berkeley. So that I'm going to send in a change address to myself 49 Bitcoins. Right, so he's taking these two piggy banks, broken them up completely because he needed to break open at least this much Bitcoin, sent however much he wanted to me, and then sent the rest back to himself into a new piggy bank. And then from there I say, oh, I'm actually a billionaire too. I think Jillian didn't know about Bitcoin until 2017, so I'll send her 101 Bitcoins. I right, just take the piggy bank open and send it to Jillian to her address, and now she has control of those bitcoins. Are there any questions about this process about the UTXO model? Mm -hmm. So the piggy banks just say this like transactions, basically. So like, it seems like like on the Brian side it says transaction A and transaction B. Yes. And so like, it seems like they came from initial like other transactions. Mm -hmm. So are those same transactions actually used as like the accounts. That Right, so the transactions themselves aren't the accounts, but the address to which the output is registered, that is the account, so to say. You can add up all of your money by adding up all of your unspent transaction outputs. Back there. Um, so when the Bitcoin lands to your like, wallet, mm -hmm. uh, is it just in one piggy bank? You know, right, so when Bitcoin lands into your wallet, is it one piggy bank, is it two? The answer is that it's in the blockchain, it's a bunch of different piggy banks, even if you say, send it to the same address, it's still going into a new piggy bank, but it's, it looks to you for convenience, like it's just one giant chest. It's a chest of piggy banks. To be able to spend, do you need to know how many piggy banks you have, or it's, it doesn't matter? Right, so the question is, do you need to know how many piggy banks you have? The answer is that the wallet software will take care of it for you. Uh, you just need to have the funds available when you sum up a certain amount of them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the 150 goes to that transaction and then 49 comes back. Could the process be interfered with before the change comes back? Could the process be interfered with for generating and sending the change address? No, that could not be interfered with because it's part of the transaction. In order for part of it to go through, the whole thing has to go through. Yeah, one last question. Go ahead. Uh, the second input just goes to the change, but shouldn't it go to both addresses because one coin goes to Right. So, that's a little misleading. Just think about both the inputs coming together at the point and then separating again. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's take a little break. Uh, let's say five minutes. So we'll be back here at 2.52. i go ahead and talk to your neighbors, get acquainted with each other, uh, talk to TAs, talk to me. A little break since it's already been about 15 minutes.
you come up and make sure you um, get the attendance line. Um, yeah. Should be tomorrow. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, how's it going? Are you enrolled in this? Yeah. Cool. Nice. Yes. the most buzzwordy parts. So we know how to identify people. We know how to enable people to send transactions. The question is how do we keep track of all that's happened in the Bitcoin blockchain? And more importantly, who keeps track of all of it? So we know that in a traditional system, you have a single database run by a single company where they can access all of this information at their leisure. They can update it at their leisure. They don't need to coordinate with anyone else. And that makes it efficient. It makes it easy to control. But in this decentralized system where we don't trust anyone, how do we ensure that happens? With a distributed database. So for simplicity, uh, there's only five people in this network. Myself, Brian, Jillian, and the other people involved in education. And this table right here is a simplified version of what the blockchain looks like. But Keep in mind, we're just considering where does this information actually live. In Bitcoin, every single person is the bank. Every single person stores their own version of the ledger. Right? We don't have this one magical point in space where we look to for information about Bitcoin. Instead, we ask people we trust or just anyone what their opinion is, their opinion, their mathematical opinion about what the state is of the Bitcoin blockchain. If one person loses or corrupts their version of the database, whether intentionally or not, we can check with everyone else to see whether or not the records are correct. And that's what enables Bitcoin to be immutable. It keeps one person from being the central point of failure, and it ensures that there's always a second person to ask for an opinion on what the truth is in the Bitcoin blockchain, what the set of transactions looks like, what the history looks like. And the reason blockchain comes into this is because of verification and record keeping in an efficient manner. We don't want to store every transaction as it comes in. We don't want to verify every transaction individually that we see. Instead, we want to do this in batches and updates, so to say, in rounds of voting, so that we don't have to handle each one individually. Otherwise, it gets really hard to deal with. And on top of that, if we just have a list of transactions timestamped, it's hard to tell, like, when, like, it's hard to divide that up into different time frames, into uh, meaningful stages. So we chunk it into blocks for these two reasons. One, to batch it, make it easier to process, and two, so that we can identify at every step of the, of the blockchain what the state of the database looks like. Right? That's what the magic is behind the words block and chain. Block refers to an update that's put on this chain of previously existing history. Right? Anyone can access this information, anyone can try to manipulate it, and in spite of this highly adversarial environment, you're still able to maintain consistency between all parties using a blockchain. If at any point someone disagrees, you can just talk to everyone else and find what the majority thinks that the truth is. Are there any questions? So then, uh, theoretically, Right, so the question was, if 51% or if a majority of people assume a different truth, does the truth now change? How do we know what the correct truth was? The answer is that it depends on how that corruption happens. Like, you have Bitcoin Cash, for example, spinning off of Bitcoin. Uh, the, Whichever one you consider the, the honest majority, like you still have two different versions that exist because they're coordinated, so to say. If you have an uncoordinated corruption, then if you have at least one honest version of the blockchain, you can recover it. But that person, um, they could manipulate it if they wanted to. Right? So in the time frame that you have just a few versions, it's very susceptible, but there's certain mechanisms that will make it difficult to actually produce a different yet still seemingly correct blockchain, which we'll discuss in lecture three, which is involved with the mining process. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, what if there are only two people in the blockchain system? Like, which one should we test? Right. If there's only two people in the system, you can't really trust either of them. Uh, there's, again, a specific mining protocol that will ensure that every block is verified. So I'll go into that probably a little later today and in lecture three. Like if a giant, giant mining rig in China controls 50% of all the nodes, like what's stopping them from controlling everything? Right. I'll go into mining, like uh, the differences in power very like in the next section. Mm -hmm. Consensus, proof of work. This is what enables every party in the Bitcoin network to stay in the same, stay on the same page as every other node. We know how to identify people, how to make transactions, how to store this information, but we don't yet know how to make an update to this global record. So let's keep in mind the goal of this and the necessity for consensus between parties. In a bank, the consensus is the bank and the bank itself, and the government, which will, in different stages, audit the progress of the bank. In Bitcoin, we need to make sure that every step, every update to this global database is verified and processed before it is included in the global blockchain. Also because every person, it needs to take the power of every person to update their version in order for it to be considered legitimate. Right, so in basic consensus, and when we have a bunch of different parties trying to agree on the same thing, we could say that every valid transaction will be accepted by every party that sees it. Right? This is a very basic version of consensus. This is, uh, we'll show why each version doesn't work and then finally get to why Bitcoin's innovation. This is not the way Bitcoin works just yet. In basic consensus, we could have a system in which everyone just says, I see a transaction I like, I approve it. We have this issue of what's known as the double spend attack. Unlike in banks, which will watch for uh, funds being used in different places, we have to watch as a whole, as a community, as to when someone's trying to do something that is illicit, such as spend funds in multiple places. Let's say that Jillian, the designated adversary, sends some 10 Bitcoin to me, and she sends 10 Bitcoin to Brian, but little do we know that this 10 Bitcoin is the same Bitcoin, the same piggy bank, being sent to both of us. I see the transaction is valid and I accept it. Brian sees the transaction is valid and he accepts it because neither of us have any information about what anyone else sees. In this situation, if either Brian or myself try to redeem this Bitcoin with the network, we're going to have a lot of issues. It's going to look to Nick and Aparna like this transaction never happened. It's going to look to Brian like he is the one who should be able to use those Bitcoin. So in the system where we come to agreements by just looking at individual transactions on our own, in silo, we are not able to pr protect against these double spend attacks. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone need any clarification? Ask now or forever hold your peace. Of course. All right, so in order to make sure that we don't make decisions like this on our own, we communicate with every single person in the network before we come to a conclusion on whether a transaction is valid or not. Right, we're able to check on our own whether a signature is valid, we're able to check whether the funds exist, in order to make sure that the funds are not being used elsewhere, we talk to everyone to say, have you seen anything that makes it look like this transaction sketchy? Right, so every time Julian sends out a transaction, we relay that transaction to everyone else and cast a vote at the end of some time period. And only after we see a certain number of votes, a majority, let's say, we're going to save that into our blockchain. So now when Julian tries to do the same thing she did in the last version, send one transaction to me and a conflicting transaction to Brian, we communicate with everyone, they will let us know that there is this issue where there's two transactions trying to use the same amount of Bitcoin. Now, what's done here could vary from protocol to protocol. You could say, all right, let none of the transactions go through and send to Jillian. Uh, let's just let one of the transactions go through. But either way, we've ensured that a double spend does not occur. And we've ensured that both transactions are not able to happen because we're seeing what everyone else thinks about these particular sets of transactions. But we've made a, a fatal flaw in the assumptions that we make in this round of consensus. We assume that we know who Nick are and Aparna are. In actuality, Jillian could have killed them both, stolen their identities, and become them. And now she can vote on her own behalf under the guise of someone else. And when that happens, we're incapable of protecting ourselves in this voting system. Bitcoin is meant to be trustless, anonymous. It's meant to keep anyone from being prohibited from joining the network. So how do we protect against this attack? 
Right? We see here that Jillian produces a bunch of identities. She can vote saying, yeah, oh, sure, these are all good transactions, and later have conflicts within the network. Right? When this majority is voting on something that goes against the protocol, we lose all of the trust, all of the legitimacy in this protocol. We're incapable of distinguishing who Jillian is and who Jillian is not, and for that reason, we can't protect against this attack in the system. And this is what's known as a Sybil attack, when someone generates multiple identities for their own behalf to conduct some malicious activity. So this is where the innovation of Satoshi comes into play. He said, we shouldn't cast votes with identities as we do in conventional systems. Instead, we should cast votes with resources. And that's where proof of work comes in. Proof of work, proof standing for evidence, and work standing for spent resources, means that in order to cast a vote, you don't have to prove that you're, you are some digital entity. Instead, you prove that you've spent some resources prior to casting a vote on some transaction or some block. So now, in spite of all of the different identities that Jillian tries to create, we are going to be able to limit her to her single set of resources. So in this situation, I have one laptop, Brian has one laptop, Jillian has one laptop. We are all trying to solve the same problem, a problem that's algorithmically, algorithmically generated, which is like a brute force problem. We don't know the, in, we don't know the inputs to outputs. We don't know how to guess how we're going to get the right output. All we know is that we can try as many inputs as we want. And once we've found an input that generates the output we want, can we then say, yes, I'm able to vote on this thing? In other words, in order for someone to have found this input, they have to have spent a certain amount of resources in order for them to have found the input. Which means that only by accepting the inputs can we ensure that, or only by accepting the valid outputs can we ensure that people are spending these resources. Right? So in other words, because Brian and I have majority of computing power, we're able to overrule Jillian's votes whenever she tries to do something that is malicious. And so now, instead of this system right here, where Jillian's able to vote all of us down, we're now tethering her to this single set of resources to ensure that she must first find the proof of work before she's able to cast a vote. Thus, with no regulation, you're able to limit people to their individual identities, which I think is the really cool thing about Nakamoto consensus. Are there any questions? In the back. Have you set the threshold for the number of resources you need to spend to um, be able to participate? <coughs> right. How do you set the threshold for the number of resources that you need in order to participate? Well, Bitcoin tries to maintain a block time of 10 minutes per block, meaning that every two weeks it'll say, okay, 2016 blocks should have been produced in this time frame. Did we produce more or did we produce less? If we produced more, that means that people are solving the puzzle easily, meaning that they've gained computing power, meaning that we need to increment the difficulty, and if people are solving less, that means that the puzzle is too hard, it's taking too many resources, we need to lower the difficulty. And yeah, we'll discuss that in the lecture three technical overview. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm a lawyer. Right? So, yeah. so the idea is basically you make it artificially expensive for Jillian to reproduce his identity time and again to game the whole system. Is this the idea? Yes. So why do you need to use this terribly energy intensive way of making it expensive? I mean, the common footprint of the system is, as we know, terrible. Mm. So, so was he so was he so ingenious a question? So the question is an enemy of the environment. Right. So the question is why do we all why do we all fawn over this destructive carbon generating like, technology? Well the answer is that when you look at it from the apathetic scientist standpoint, you see that it it solves a problem that no one else could solve before, which is tethering not only identity, but tethering voting power to this external resource. And you can prove that every vote has cost this much, therefore like, it, is, it is equal to the cost of this. Right? And as the cost of the vote increases, you're proving that the security is greater. So you're able to maintain the security of the network, which is very important. On top of that, it was the first to do so. A lot of people are trying to change this, like they're trying to solve this problem with a different resource, like time or uh, currency itself. But this was what it took to get cryptocurrencies off the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in this example, what if Jillian just had like two laptops or just more resources? 
Right, so we'll go over that very quickly about if Jillian had more resources. Any questions to clarify this? Mm -hmm. Right, who's generating the problems? It's a very good question. We don't want a central entity generating these problems. So the problems are generated based on, uh, we'll go into this later, based on a, a hash of the information within the block. You want to use this information to create like, a partial pre image hash puzzle. In other words, you want to say that you need a certain output of this hash function to like, say that this block is valid. So you have to just keep trying inputs until you get the correct output. Jillian like solves the puzzle. What's stopping her from putting her own malicious transactions onto the blockchain? There's nothing stopping Jillian from putting her own malicious transactions in the block. The difference is that we can outvote Jillian's vote by creating a different chain that doesn't include her transactions, which I'll go into very shortly. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you prevent large entities that have a lot of lot of resources, such as governments, to? Over, right, over so I will go into that uh, near the end of the lecture. So, uh, yeah. any last questions to clarify the model we saw here? Mm -hmm. So is everyone given a different puzzle then? Everyone's given, it depends, every person who's voting on a different block is given, a, is working with a different puzzle, yes. So to clarify some things to understand better what it looks like at the lower level, we know the blockchain to be a chain of blocks. What happens if two votes are cast at the same time? We get what's called a fork. In this situation, we have two different things that have, that have happened allegedly at once. But we can't recognize both of these things as having happened. So we need to decide on one or the other. We need a, a protocol for deciding which chain is more legitimate than the other. The idea is that one of these two will eventually have a block stuck upon them. Right? Eventually, some miner is going to find a block that has to be based on one chain or the other. It can't be based on both. So when that happens, people will run to the longer chain and start mining on that and abandon the previous chain. So that it's as if that block was never, it never happened. Right. And this comes into play when it comes to the 51% attacks. So let's say Jillian was actually secretly a trillionaire and she bought all of these laptops. How can we stop her? We can't. That's the answer right there. You can't stop a 51% attack from happening for the for this very simple proof. Let's say that you could have an honest minority decide the truth of the blockchain. That means you could also have an, a dishonest minority decide the truth. So we have to recognize the majority of computing power as honest. We have to make that assumption if we want Bitcoin to work. If that assumption is broken, then Jillian has full absolute control over the future history of the Bitcoin blockchain, which is why 51% attacks are so very scary. There was a, I forget the name of the pool. Uh, there was a pool back in, I want to say 2013, 2014, maybe earlier, which almost had 51% of the mining power. That pool, miners voluntarily withdrew their resources because they knew just how significant and how frightening a 51% attack was. Right, this is probably the most discussed attack in Bitcoin because it's, I mean, it kind of yields itself to philosophy as well. Like, who gets to decide the truth and what does it really mean? Like, is there a way to stop a majority of people or voting power from having a say in what the truth is? Right, so this attack, when you have large, like, companies with large amounts of resources, it's impossible to stop them if they have 51% of the mining power and the incentive to use that maliciously. And what that looks like at the blockchain level, let's say that Jillian is promising Nick 3.2 Bitcoin in exchange for getting a free A in 61C. But Jillian doesn't actually want to give up her Bitcoin, but she still wants the A. What Jillian can do is say to Nick, here, I'm sending this transaction, get it verified, but in a separate chain, produce a new transaction with that same piggy bank to herself. If she manages to get a block on that chain, and Nick has already given his services to Jillian, that Jillian has successfully double spent those Bitcoin. She's used them for a service, but never actually given them up. So the reason that Jillian needs to send a transaction to herself is because if she doesn't, Nick can say, oh, hey, this transaction that was in a block that didn't go through is still technically valid. It has the signature, it has the funds, it, has been, it is not being used anywhere else. Network, can you please approve this transaction? It got lost. So by doing this, Jillian is breaking the piggy bank, giving it to herself before Nick has the opportunity to use it in a different block. And this is where 
the 51% attack comes in, if Jillian has a majority of the mining power, she can always produce the longer chain. She can always fork from everyone else and say, this is my chain. You can't stop me. I'm producing too many identities for you to track. I, the, whatever happens in this network, I decide. So that's why the 51% attack is so scary. Are there any questions so far about any of this last stuff? All right, so quickly to review, we have four components for Bitcoin. Identity, transactions, record keeping, and consensus. All of the stuff which was typically handled by a bank now being handled by the users themselves. Identity, we produce a private key at random and we generate a public key with it which we share with the network. Transactions, we have UTXOs or piggy banks that we use to handle and send Bitcoin between each other. And the sum of your money, Bitcoin, is implicitly the sum of all of these outputs. Record keeping, every entity keeps a copy of the blockchain or the distributed ledger, which can be easily checked if there's corruption. And consensus, where you have proof of work, external resources being used as a voting mechanism to deter double spend attacks. And more on the economic side, as Bitcoin is trying to fulfill the goals of a currency, like here are the standards that are set forth for a currency, the properties that some currency should have. Scarcity, Bitcoin has scarcity because well, for two reasons. One, it takes a certain amount of mining power to produce Bitcoin. You can't just in generate Bitcoin at the Federal Reserve as much as you want. You have to operate within the scope of these 21 million Bitcoin, of which no more will ever exist. There's a block reward produced for every miner that manages to solve the proof of work puzzle, and that miner gets Bitcoin of some amount that is decreasing over the years until finally it decreases to zero, meaning that there will be only 21 million Bitcoin ever in existence. Fungibility, uh, Bitcoin is for the most part interchangeable and, interchangeable and identical. Like if I swap my piggy bank with yours, it's almost impossible to tell unless you're dealing with, with some shady people and the FBI knows who those shady people are, they can track your activity with that person. Divisibility, because Bitcoin is just a number, you can go all the way down to a 10 to the eighth of a Bitcoin or one Satoshi for ease and precision of your payments. And durability, as long as the blockchain exists, so Bitcoin, your Bitcoin can't be destroyed unless the physical device holding your private key is destroyed as well. And transferability, you can transfer Bitcoin between any two people in the globe with no difference to the network. Banks are limited by country, but Bitcoin is a global infrastructure that does not care who you are, where you are, or where you're sending money to or from. But most importantly, legitimacy. Before we trusted the banks, but when the trust started to disappear, we put our trust in math and protocols instead. We trust that Bitcoin, which is the mathematical accumulation of several years of research, is preferable than trusting individuals. Right? And that legitimacy gives Bitcoin its value. We trust that Bitcoin as a technology, as a currency, is valuable enough to where we want to spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars just to hold a single Bitcoin. And finally, I hope you all understand these terms. So please take like 30 seconds to turn to your neighbors, explain what each of these terms means to you, and I would like the audience to tell me what you think of each of these terms now. Right, go ahead.
themselves and talk about anonymous. I heard a lot of good discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's anonymous. You can buy like black tar heroin without the FBI <laughs> tracking you. All right. Well, what else can you do with? Like, why is anonymity important in general? Like, why do we prefer anonymity here as opposed to having everyone register with a central entity? Precisely. The anonymity is important because we don't trust central entities with, with our identity. We don't want to reveal ourselves unless, unless we choose ourselves to. Like, we don't really need to record this lecture ourselves. It's been recorded on every one of our phones because of the FBI. Right? We, don't really, we don't really have control of our identity anymore because of, like, we've kind of entered, what might argue, this dystopia where everyone is being tracked, their location, their activity, their friends, their behavior at all times. Okay, decentralized. Be brave. Mm -hmm. um, I think decentralized means all the transaction data um, is stored in the entire uh, internet, entire blockchain system, uh, rather than uh, someone's computer or database. And why is decentralized meaningful in the context of Bitcoin? Because uh, no one, for example, um, a commercial Right. You have to destroy everyone in the network in order to destroy Bitcoin. It's no longer just one company that might go bankrupt. It's an entire global institution. All right. Immutable, which kind of plays into decentralized. Right, every single transaction is recorded. You, you can't change the history unless you change every single version of the blockchain, of the Bitcoin blockchain. Right, that's a lot of power, knowing that what you've done isn't going to be replaced or deleted because some company thinks that they don't have enough space in their servers. All right, trustless. In the back. Right. The point brought up was scalability. If you don't have to trust anyone, you no longer need to rely on one point as the bottleneck. You can now go to anyone in this network and trust that through the protocol, they will be incentivized in order to behave honestly on your part, or if they're not behaving honestly, will have to face the penalties. Consensus? Right. And that's important because that's what enables us to have this open network where anyone can participate in the consensus protocol, but we still maintain honesty and integrity of the network, which I think is the most magical part of Bitcoin. And then finally, global. How is Bitcoin a global infrastructure? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not discriminatory. Anyone can join as long as you're sources. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like currency, you have to do like fiat conversions. Sorry, what was that point? You have to do like fiat conversions. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. So there's no, uh, you can do international trace without any barriers set by the governments? Right. No matter where you live, no matter who you are, as long as you have a computer and the bandwidth and the resources, you can participate in the Bitcoin blockchain, which is not something you can say about a bank. It's not something you can say about mostly anything. Right? Everything is controlled by a central entity, whether it be a company, a bank, a school. Like, but in this system, anyone from anywhere can join in this network and act as equally as anyone else. Bitcoin doesn't care who you are, where you live, what your finances look like, what your life looks like. As long as you're a rational, or as long as you're an honest actor, a good actor, Bitcoin is just as friendly as it is to anyone else.
Wow. So some final words with some questions to think about are how well does Bitcoin meet the definition of these three particular things that currency should enable? Store of unit, store of value, unit of account, medium of exchange. How many people do you know that think of Bitcoin as a market cap before they think of it as a technology? And can you now explain Bitcoin to your grandmother? Perhaps not with the detail here, but in like five minutes, yeah, you have a bunch of people voting on stuff. Are there any questions before we wrap up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, so the question is, can a bunch of people collude? Yes, that happened before, not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what would be the incentive to not collude? The incentive to not collude, if I, if anyone proves that the protocol is broken, the value of Bitcoin is gonna drop faster than anything else. Right? You're not gonna be able to sell fast enough, unless you know ahead of time. But if you, unless you're shorting currency or you're expecting Bitcoin to fall, the collusion and the detection of this collusion is going to lead to the destruction of Bitcoin and probably a lot of other cryptocurrencies. Right. Can the government get control given its immense amount of resources? The answer is yes, but it would still be very expensive because it would take, I forget the number, it's something in the realm of 10 to the 20 exahash. Is an immense amount, like enough to power, I think, either Denmark or some reasonably sized country. Like you would need all that energy just to be able to have 51% for a split second, let alone for a reliable amount of time, because there's always new miners coming in. All right. Yeah, one last question. Uh, what's the relationship between the proof of work and mm -hmm. maintaining the ledgers? Right, the relationship between proof of work and maintaining the ledger. Proof of work is the update mechanism for the database. Right? Identity transactions, record keeping, this allows us to confirm what happened in the past and make things happen in the future. But proof of work is the mechanism by which we formally say this should be allowed to be part of the history of the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, since Bitcoin is held up by a network of miners, mm -hmm. what happens when um, eventually there's no more Bitcoin miners? Right, the transaction fees will skyrocket. All right, so here's your homework for all of you who are in the class. You want to sign up for Piazza, check out our syllabus, make sure you know what the course structure and policy is, attend discussions. The things that you actually have to do are read the assigned readings, bring an article from Coindesk or any other place to discussion, and then teach someone, I mean, obviously you can't enforce this, but we highly advise you to make sure that you understand Bitcoin well enough, teach someone you know about how Bitcoin works. It could be your roommates, your family. Uh, fun story, actually. Um, one of my friends, Russell Lin, wrote the textbook for the class. He, his grandma forced me to explain Bitcoin to her. So shout out to Russ's grandma and all the good food she makes. And your pets, rubber ducks, RAs, or a random AFX team. Just go up there and say, hey, do you know what Bitcoin works? All right, so yes, please have this done by the next discussion section or by the next lecture. All right. Thank you. Wait, okay, first of all, can we have a round of applause for Nadir? Homework will be posted on the website. If you don't know the website, um, just Google it. Um, just Google blockchain Berkeley decal. It'll be there. Um, yeah, so this will be on there. Make sure you sign up for Piazza. Um, and then shoot us an email if you have any questions. But please only shoot us an email if you have questions. As much as I like to hear from you guys, I get to read all those emails. So, okay. Um,